stay on time this morning. Uh, I am Ashley Hazeltine. I'm the president of the Greater Mary London Area Chamber of Commerce. So first off, thank you all for coming out this morning. We really appreciate it. And welcome to our regional transportation update. I also wanted to introduce someone many of you met, Heidi Morrison, our membership and marketing director. So as many of you have come to our forums previously, our goal as the Chamber of Commerce is to make sure that we provide an opportunity for you to learn about different projects that affect the region as well as issues and um, different items that are going on. So we hope you get a lot of information out of the event this morning, and by all means, please, whether you're a member or a guest, please feel free to sign up for our emails, um, watch for upcoming events, and you're always welcome to attend any event that might be interesting to you. Um, before we begin the formal presentation, I did want to recognize Eversource Energy, our presenting sponsor this morning. And also, before I invite Allison up to join us, I did want to share that they were recently named the Business New Hampshire Magazine's 2019 Business of the Year. So congratulations, everyone. And I would now like to welcome Allison, who is the Community Relations and Economic Development Manager for the region. Thank you, Ashley. Um, so good morning, everyone. Um, it's uh, really a pleasure to be here. And I'm, I'm really saying uh, good morning on behalf of the 1,400 employees that we have here from Eversource in New Hampshire. But also because this is a, a regional discussion, uh, this uh, we have over 9,000 employees in our three states. So uh, we, we, we say hello, good morning, and welcome. Um, as Ashley said, I am uh, the manager for Eversource's Community Relations and Economic Development. And it is our, it's really happy to be here. Um, as many of you know, Eversource is uh, an energy leader, uh, and we power up to about 75% of the state of New Hampshire, along with the greater Boston, the Cape, and, and most of Connecticut. Uh, being a regulated, regulated utility company, we have we have assigned service territory. You know, we 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 we, we have, we're in our spaces that we're supposed to be. But the successes of uh, all of you and the businesses. Uh, is really what helps to power us. So it's really you. You are really powering us to uh, to you know help create a, a vivacious and vital community around us. Um, but to do our part, uh, we do try to focus on on uh, you know the poles and the wires. We try to keep the power on. We try to bring in the reliable power. We are focused on clean energy technology, um, and we also uh, do our part to play a, a strong partner in economic development. We, we uh, uh, partner with many, many of the local chambers, uh, London Dairy and Dairy Chamber, uh, and we also, uh, we focus on a lot of our industry groups, uh, places like the New Hampshire Travel Council, the New Hampshire Grocers Association, you name it. We are involved because community is really what um, brings us together. Um, I know many of you here work closely with Elizabeth LaRocca, um, she is our point of contact, our lead for community relations and economic development in the area. So if you haven't met Elizabeth, please do so. Um, uh, many of the local leaders here uh, work tirelessly to, in our neighboring towns and cities and our states to partner on infrastructure. Uh, and as talking to Ted, it is the connectivity that is important. It is what we need to do. We need to make these connections, both uh, people, business, but place. We need to make sure we can get people to different places. So. Um, we have two very important infrastructure projects here in the area that I know we're going to talk about today. This is the Exit 4A and also the Manchester Boston Regional Airport. So without further ado, um, I'd like to say you know, good morning to everybody and welcome to those speakers. So again, thank you on behalf of Eversource. Have a great day. And we do have a slight um, just update from what is in the program. So joining us from Fuston O'Neill is someone that works alongside Bill Ashford. We're going to have Nicole Fox join us this morning to go over Exit 4A. Thank you. You can see how it's going to be easier for you. All right, so just a quick overview of what we're going to talk about. Um, and this is the purpose of the project brief history, overview of the preferred alternative, the affected properties, uh, the project time frame for construction, and then we'll have time for questions and comments. 
So there's um, a double purpose for the project. Um, the first is to reduce congestion um, along 102 uh, through downtown Derry to allow um, uh, improved um, traffic flow and vitality in downtown. And also to promote economic vitality in the Derry, London Derry area where the improvements will be made. So currently, uh, we are working on the Supplemental Draft Environmental Impact Statement, which is an update to the Draft Environmental, the environmental Impact Statement. So there was a public informational meeting where we discussed all the alternatives. There were five build alternatives, and that happened last May. Uh, following that meeting, we had another meeting in July where the Alternative A was reconfirmed as a preferred alternative. That's what was found um, previously as well. And then the public hearing was held last December. So Alternative A includes a new interchange um, north of Exit 4. Uh, it's a diamond-shaped interchange with a connection only to the east. There is no westerly connection. There's a new roadway that will be built from the interchange that will tie into Folsom Road right at North High Street. It also includes a number of improvements to local roads and intersections along Folsom Road and Geneva Road primarily, but also uh, a little bit of improvement to all of the intersecting roads there including New Hampshire uh, 28 and 25 paths in 102. Uh, the total length from the interstate out to 102 is approximately three miles. So there's a number of property impacts. This is due largely to new and widened roadways and also to stormwater treatment areas uh, to handle, um, to improve water quality. There are 13 residences that had to be have to be acquired in order to construct this project, and four um, business units um, affecting 25 businesses. Those businesses will um, be provided relocation assistance by the state. So these are some we call typical sections that show generally what um, a slice of the road would look like. So. The connector road, which is the new road that goes from the interstate over to Folsom, and Folsom Road as well, would have uh, five lanes divided with the median. Uh, the first section of Shenito Road from 28 to the 28 bypass will have three lanes. It will also have a sidewalk on both sides of the road. Uh, the more residential uh, eastern portion of Shenito Road will have a curb on both sides, but sidewalk only on the north side. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, going back to Folsom Road and the Connector Road, those will both act. That will have sidewalks on both sides as well. Um, and then Route 102 will remain largely the same. There will be an additional, um, some additional turn lanes, um, but otherwise it will primarily still be a two lane road with um, no or sidewalk. All right, so now we're going to switch over to some of the plans so we can show you what the have designed so far. Just one second. I have to figure out how to exit the slideshow. <laughs> Bridge has been built. And then on the 
go quite a ways north. There will be sound walls constructed on the southbound side um, for both ramps and on the um, northbound on ramps, so north of the interchange. If you want to switch to the other one. Um, so then where the connector road is, Road then cuts through what um, will become the Mon Commons property. Uh, this the state has determined that there will be um, a special kind of right of way that limits the number of uh, driveway access points through this area. But they are allowing two um, two sets of driveways through the Mon Commons, and that um, controlled access right of way will extend all the way to North High Street and Dairy. IT people in the house. Dairy um, Rail Trail, there will 
be any issues for them. So then as we move to the east, um, this is Franklin Street. Again, a little minor lighting at the intersection. But then all along Folsom Road as we head towards um, New Hampshire 28, there, I gotta go earn my 20 basically checks. every, um, almost every building that is fronting Folsom Road on the north side now needs to be acquired, and those are a mix of uh, businesses and residences. But we held the, um, the south side of the road, and so that none of the houses on the um, in the residential neighborhood to the south were affected. Will we pipe in with questions now, or do you want? Because I have I have one specific. Sure. Okay. The one property that you're not taking, the one that's Z-shaped, if you will? Yes, that's the is car that, wash. That's the car wash. So the Salvation Army that just celebrated the fact that they now have a permanent home is one of the buildings that's in striping. Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, red and white is, in, is the indication that it's, um, it's being yeah, just taken. Yeah. So um, then on the um, right side of the screen, that is uh, 28. There are no changes um, on the Manchester Road portion of 28 to the north. That will stay almost exactly the same, except as it ties into Folsom Road and Chimino Road. And there is a little bit of, um, I think there's one extra lane on Crystal Ave. Um, Good news is the Pinkerton Street intersection with Shenita Rose will be signalized. So there will also be, um, so yeah, so there, it's a very complicated inter set of intersections, so close to 28, as I'm sure probably most of you are already aware, um, and fairly dangerous, so um, that should be greatly improved once this is constructed. As I mentioned before, there is sidewalk, wider shoulders on both sides of Shenita Road through this section. Uh, there is a median that exists until you kind of get past the turn lanes for Pinkerton, uh, but then for the rest of the distance all the way over to the 28 bypass is a center turn lane. Are you coordinating the two lights together? Or <coughs> they yes, they will be um, They will be mm -hmm. a coordinated system, so they'll function together. Otherwise, Right, you've got that would be a disaster. 200 it's, feet of it's so, close, <coughs> they're so close to one another, they really will function almost as one um, signal system. So this is the uh, 20 bypass. Again, just some intersection improvements here. And then we start to head into the uh, two-lane section of Shadio Road. With the, so the sidewalk on the south side drops away. We just maintain the north side. Um, but the shoulders are on both sides the whole way. And all of this area will be curved to allow for stormwater to collect the stormwater and then to treat it uh, as much as possible. Um, yeah, there's you know, some work needed to be done to tie into all of the minor side roads. This section of Shenito Road um, has a lot of geometric issues currently. Um, there's a slopes, there's some curves that are too tight, both vertical curves and horizontal curves, and all of that will be um, brought up to design standards. So that will be um, a much safer and smoother ride than it is right now. Um, and then as we head over, <coughs> there's just some um, intersection improvements for 102 that actually extend up. There's a, an extra turn lane for English Range Road. Uh, the intersection with North Shore, similar to Pinkerton being so close to 28, North Shore um, Road is so close to Shenito Road on 102 that it creates a really unsafe situation right now. And again, like the Pinkerton and 28 signals, they'll be operated together um, to ensure that traffic doesn't get stuck in a position where they can't get cars left in an unsafe spot. I'm sorry, so there's 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 lights at the intersection. Oh, Shinito well, Road is one of two. And, and North Shore is one of two? Yep. Well, yeah, so they're going to work together. 
they're, they're about 200 feet apart. And so um, the queuing, you know, the, the line of cars that, that would be at the Shinito Road Light would have backed up past North Shore, making it very difficult for um, people to use to turn otherwise. And currently, it's a really dangerous situation and quite difficult to turn left on North Shore Road. So it'll actually be you know, a net improvement. And we can flip back, I think. Unless anyone has any comments, questions about this right now, we can always come back afterward as well. Sure. Um, so my business is going to be the Community Strike. <laughs> OK. Um, on North High Street. What time frame are we looking at? Um, so actually, when we get back to the slideshow, there's a little bit of information about that. with 
what your desires are. Because once they have construction plans in place, it's really hard to have changes. And is there an appropriate point of contact? Yes, it is the project manager for the state, which in this case for NHGUT is Keith Coda. Okay, and then um, as far as the condition of the plans that you have right now, is that uh, those get advanced to a qualifying group of design build teams? Mm -hmm. How complete are those? Is it 10%, 90%, 50%? So the plans as they are now are probably a stage that would be, they would call those plans but as I said they're going to be advanced further before they go to um, des design build teams but that would probably get them to not quite 30 percent if that because um, at that point we're starting to look at more of the details of drainage which won't necessarily be the, take the case that'll be left to the design build team so speaking I guess selfishly on behalf of um, them, as a guest of the folks at their medical center here um, mm -hmm. We collectively control about 200,000 square feet of space on Shenino Road, mixed between um, three buildings currently, fourth building under construction that's not represented on those plans. Okay. Um, big concern for us is you know safety, obviously, of staff, but more importantly, safety of patients. Um, this is 40,000 active patients at Jury Medical Center right now, and any folks who are uh, coming in and out of particularly six Shenino Road, the overall building see that from a, a traffic mitigation standpoint or a level of service standpoint from those site driveways, it, certain times of day it can be challenging. Sure. Um, what kinds of considerations are you putting into place for level of service of existing driveways that would be affected from the increased flow of traffic um, resulting from this project? Um, are you talking about during construction or following completion? Following completion. Okay. Um, so the level of traffic on Shenito Road, so there's there's a, a, quite a large volume of traffic that'll be coming up the interstate. However, it really dissipates quite a bit once it hits 28. So there will be an increase in traffic on Shenito Road. It won't be, it, it will be less than, I think the number is somewhere between 25%, and that's reaching out quite a ways. Um, there will be that left turn lane, um, which will continue um, to be present to allow for um, traffic to safely wait outside of um, the flow of other traffic. Um, the shoulders will be wider, so sight distance will be easier. And there will be, um, with the traffic lights at Pinkerton and 28 and the 28 bypass, should allow for platooning so that, which, sorry, is um, a term that where all the cars sort of come at once, um, and then, you know, for, when the light turns green, a whole bunch of cars come, and then there's a break in traffic. So, as part of a recent project, I know that we had approved on this for an ambulatory surgery center and additional medical office space, um, our traffic engineers had evaluated a 2020 build out, which included the gates of 4A. Sure. And what we saw in that analysis was a level of service in the site intersections from something in the order of A, B down to an F. And, it, you know, is there any consideration for additional signalized intersections with respect to this uh, project? Not as far as this project goes, but that does not preclude um, any future traffic signals. So this is. This project was started by the towns and currently actually still is a town project, but is being managed by NHDOT. And as soon as they enter into the design build process, it completely becomes a DOT project. So, but Shenito Road is a town road, so that is a dairy um, uh, road. So any future traffic signals would go through the town of dairy. So putting it in the framework of sort of patient safety, is that something that we thought would be appropriate to circle back with DOT and have it to their attention? Um, you would be welcome to bring it to their attention. I, I can't say what their feelings are. So, sure. Yeah. So the main uh, 93 is supposed to be complete in the 2021. When is the main? Oh, the completion of the I-93 widening? Yes. 
think it's 2022. Is this going to impact or slow it down? No, this will not impact uh, the work that they're currently doing on 93. Um, if, if anything, they're hoping to try to get this project started while they still um, have the construction going on 93, just for ease of um, when everything's still sort of torn up, you can put your pipes, whatever additional pipes you need, and without having to disrupt traffic again. So. That's what I was wondering. <laughs> The, the timing is tricky, um, and again, the 2023 that would be the that would be the local roads. That would be um, it's much easier to build new roads that don't have traffic on them, and much faster. So, their plan is to start with um, all the new all the new roads, the ramps, the new bridge over the highway, everything on the connector, really up until you tie into Folsom Road. Um, first and so I imagine that again because construction is so much faster when you're not dealing with maintaining the existing traffic on it I would imagine that that would probably only take a couple of years whereas that sort of work if you're operating it as you have all experience with exit four it takes quite a while yeah um, so my question but I'm pretty sure the 93 winding is supposed to be completed by next year uh, but there was never an issue with doing this after the completion of that. It, that was always the plan that this would start after that was completed. Uh, but my question is, when is the um, record of decision scheduled for now for the EIS? The record of decision is scheduled for late summer. Late summer this year. Okay. So like August? I believe so, yes. Yeah. This is completed. Is this going to be a class five or class six road? Uh, which one? The, the new road going in, going down to uh, one or two. Um, principal or the new road will be a principal arterial, which I believe is class two. I think. I believe it's class two. So the new road, yeah. I have a question for you. Sure. Since I get probably more, I'm just one of the state reps out of dairy, I get more questions involving this project than you could possibly imagine. Uh, huh. And I've, I've watched this go on since I was a kid. This project started in 1982. So I'm cautiously optimistic anytime someone puts a time frame on anything when it comes to this. When you're talking about the construction of the new roads first, at what point do they open? Are you going to wait for this entire thing to complete to tie it in past the police station? Or are you going to start to tie it into Folsom Road during construction? So that is a decision that would be made uh, between the department and the design build team. My suspicion, which really just my best guess um, is that they would probably not connect the interchange they would not open it until they at least built to, to 28 so what exactly is your company you, you guys is role in this so we, are, we have been handling the completion of the environmental impact statement and the studies that go along with it so there's a traffic study there's this conceptual design there have been economic, environmental analyses, all sorts of historic, all sorts of components that go into this. This is um, part of the environmental permitting. <coughs> and so our contract is to um, complete the environmental impact statement, get, to the, get the record of decision, uh, and then we have been, um, then we'll be assisting the department to complete the, what they call their base technical concept to prepare for the design were you involved in the decision-making process as to what properties were taken? Was that you guys? Um, or not taken? We were in charge of the layouts. I mean, in conjunction with um, the towns and the state. Um, we, yeah, we were part of that team. 
because I'm curious as to why at, at 102 and Shenido we're doing this another bizarre double intersection when the possibilities of making that a four-way have existed in the past and really could exist right now. That was that was a farm stand when I was a kid. There's nothing on it. I've already talked to Keith about this at length, but um, since you guys are the ones that kind of initiated the before so, we saw it. There is a prime wetland um, on the northern, on the northwestern <coughs> corner of Shenita Road in 102. Um, behind the house. Behind the house, yep. exactly. And it's quite large, and it extends up and wraps around. So there's really no opportunity. Any any adjustment we made to Shenita Road would automatically impact um, that wetland, which having been designated as a prime wetland would have created a number of additional issues. Um, and um, it just, ge the geometry was really quite difficult to try to bring those together, even with the consideration um, okay. so it was of like another that. acquisition. It was considered. Um, due to their close proximity, we feel pretty confident that we should be able to design a traffic signal system um, that will work without creating un undue delay. It's so close. It, it's sort of like when you have um, an interchange where you have several traffic signals within a row. But it's only two. So once you get more than two, it starts to get a little out of hand. But um, and, and those can work really well together. It's just two traffic signals to reduce delay. So questions? <laughs> <laughs> Massachusetts, when they did the uh, rotary in the filling, they put in five traffic lights in that circle. And everyone was wondering how exactly it worked. It works great. Okay. The flow through really well. They are more Excellent. That's good to hear. Anyone else? Thank you, Nicole. And now I'd like to ask Ted Kitchens, the new director of our Manchester Boston Regional Airport, to join us. And I'm just going to take a second to get an easier to read version of Ted's presentation. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, so let's let's change mode. So let's get off of the ground and let's look to the sky here. Uh, that's one of the, one of the beauties about aviation is, you know, if you are talking about a road or a rail or even sea, you know, there was never a mode that conquered all of it. And aviation really did that. So once you get in the air. You're free to roam about the country as Southwest Airlines likes to say. So you're really only limited by the amount of fuel in your aircraft and your imagination. Um, so it's a pleasure being here. Uh, it's one of my favorite topics is to talk about the airport and uh, the importance of the airport to the region. But I'm a, I'm a walker and a talker, so you'll see me move around a lot. Uh, I don't like to be stuck behind podiums. Uh, but as, as Ashley said, I have some special thoughts in the um, in the presentation, so I wanted to get a PDF version up here. So, you know, before we begin, you know, we, we do enjoy a tremendous amount of support from, you know, the local leadership, you know, Mr. Smith at Londonderry, uh, and as well as, you know, the, the, uh, uh, in the city of Manchester and all of our state uh, representation and delegation. There's, there's great alignment right now between the state and the airport, which is something that I don't think we have enjoyed, at least that's what people told me on my staff. I've only been here seven months, so I'm a new, I'm an outsider. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm just learning these things. But I, I thoroughly enjoyed the presentation on, on Route 4A because I did not know it was that big. I thought it was just a, a diamond interchange, but not this you know, long tentacle. I was just like a root canal. You know, <laughs> deep into, deep into <laughs> Speaking of which, I do need to get one. <laughs> All right, so, so today's agenda, quite honestly, I'm going to talk about the problem, the reason for the problem, the cost of the problem, and then how are we uh, going to start solving the problem. But, you know, the first rule of recognizing that, or the first rule of solving the problem is to get the answer away is recognizing that we have one, right? So you being here today and me talking about it is the first step in, in understanding uh, the issue. Next slide. Is there a clicker on that one? There it is. 
So the problem. Well, this is this is the problem right here. So since 20, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a data guy, okay? So you will get a lot of numbers here, and it's probably gonna be overwhelming. But uh, aviation is all about data. And if you don't believe that, go visit the United Airlines headquarters or the Southwest Airlines headquarters or any airline headquarters, and just count the number of data analysts, industrial engineers, financial analysts that are uh, proliferating the airline leadership. The path to the airline CEO now is through route planning and through revenue management. So they have tons of data that we don't have. So in 2013, you know, the, the, the MHG shared demand within 25 miles of the airport. That is essentially from here to maybe 495, and this is just as a as a crow flies, not in terms of, of driving distance, but just a, a, a radius around, around the airport at 25 miles has steadily eroded. So these are the number of tickets that are, that are purchased. Uh, these are just tickets, okay? This is not total number of passengers. So don't, don't think we don't have 90, or where those two numbers are, 72 plus 25. Don't think we have 100,000 passengers. These are, these are tickets, okay? This is a representative sample size of the total demand in the region. So back in 2013, mm -hmm. we were having about uh, 23, 27% by 73% leakage to Boston. So the blue is the number of tickets that were purchased within 25 miles that were leaving from Boston and the green for the number of tickets purchased within 25 miles leaving from Manchester. And you can see that's not a very good trend line for us uh, throughout time. This is year to date, 2019, so that's up through April 30th. So you can see right now we're going from about 73% uh, leakage up to close to 85% leakage. But it's time for your idiom of the day, hold your horses. So let's look at how that compares to some other airports that are similarly situated as Manchester is to Boston. Let's look at Colorado Springs. Two hours, if, if, you're, if you're a really slow driver, from Colorado Springs to a World Connecting Hub for United Airlines at Denver. Okay, so again, same number, uh, or same color scheme. The, the, the green is from the uh, airport of, uh, that are drawing the 25 mile radius circle around, and the blue is the competing hub. Look at Colorado Springs. They've kept about 55 only leaking about 55% of their demand to Denver. Let's look at Eugene, Oregon, two hours from Boston's uh, twin on the West Coast, PDX, the same type of airport. Boston can get you most, most places, uh, nonstop domestically, maybe a few international destinations. PDX offers the same type of connectivity to the fine citizens in Eugene, Oregon, but they're keeping about 70% of their demand. And then let's go look at our twin, Providence, Rhode Island. Same hub, same airline, same non-stop destinations as uh, it provides to us, and they're only leaking about 55% of the demand in Boston. Yes, ma'am. So First question. I, just so I understand the graph, let's look at 2013. So is it that fifty-two thousand and change and forty-seven and change tickets sold, and over on the far right? The, drops all the well, way to 15 and that's, that's, that's only year to date. Oh, thank you, year yeah. to date. So, thank you. So it's, it's just, Obviously, yeah. yes. So you can see here that you know, the total number of demand is uh, within Providence, let me see, get, get, get my clicker. It's actually, let's just call that uh, 70 plus 40, it's 100, 110,000, whereas over here is right about 100,000. So the demand has grown, and the same can be said about us. You know, our, our demand is about 100,000 a year. It's 120,000 over here in calendar year 18. Okay, so the demand is growing. It's just we're losing it all. Every single one of them, and then some, to, to Boston. So, 700,000 employments generated in this region is what that represented. Okay, remember I told you those were tickets. That's just a representative sample. When you took, turn, turn this into an employment, now what's an employment? An employment is you getting on an airplane. It's like you embark on a ship and you disembark, you in-plane and you deplane. Aviation owes its DNA to uh, shipping and to rail uh, to, to a large degree. Primary destinations of those 700,000 people are to Mickey Mouse Land, uh, LAX, Chicago, San Francisco, and Tampa. Now those pink, we have not stopped destinations to, or at least Chicago starting June 6th, we did uh, that start. Start flying Chicago, please, on American Airlines. Uh, primary carriers, JetBlue, American, and Delta. And you went, now, JetBlue, duh, right? 
but all those are not equal. Okay? There, there's no real preference between those three carriers. So again, American and Delta, we have those serving uh, Manchester Boston. So just looking at JetBlue, of course, MCO is the top destination for uh, JetBlue uh, leaking out of this market. So I got curious and I said, let's go to about the little database that I have that can show the quickest route between Manchester and Orlando, which of course is a nonstop Southwest flight. So I gave a very generous 45 minute connect time to get to the airport, a very generous 45 minute arrival time before your scheduled departure time, plus the flight time to Orlando. It's about four hours and 40 minutes. Giving you a two hour drive time to Boston, which is about right. Getting there two hours in advance, because you never know what you're gonna run into on 93, or at the security checkpoint, or at the parking lot, or if you miss your bus and you gotta wait another hour for the next bus, whatever it may be, you're gonna give a little buffer time Plus the nonstop jet blue flight is seven hours and 13 minutes, three hours longer. I could have you on final approach into Orlando before you get your first boarding call out of Boston. Even connecting through Charlotte, I said, let's just say I can't get a seat on that Southwest flight, or I can get a seat on American. Even connecting through Charlotte is quicker than flying nonstop out of Boston. And this is our baby picture. These are the zip codes in New Hampshire by leakage rate. And the blue is bad. Just remember, blue, bad, awesome. Okay? <laughs> the, the, the red are areas where we actually are holding on to some of the demand. And several things are readily apparent. Number one, we're not doing too well in the seacoast. Okay? You got the CNJ line that's going like this. You got the down eastern that's coming through Dover and Durham. We're not doing too well down here right along. Salem, Nashua area. We're not doing too well in downtown Concord. We're not doing too well up here in the Lakes region or over in the Upper Valley. Gee, what's the common denominator between those three locations? You got it. We have invested a lot of money as a state for people to get down to Boston. And I'll explain what that cost is to the state in terms of economic impact in a second. So what drives airline capacity? Well, this is a, a chart between, again, I said I'm a data guy, so if you need coffee, I don't blame you. Uh, this is domestic seats being flown uh, from 1990 to 2017, charted against the gross domestic product of the United States. And gee, we have a little blip right here, 2008, 2009. You can see it's a complete shift of the, of the growth curve down into the east. So uh, we're still not, have, we still have not recovered completely from the 2008-2009 recession as a, as, a, as a country. We certainly are growing, but we need to be growing at a faster rate to get back on the traditional curve. But you can see here that the seats were pretty, pretty much holding steady despite an increase in your GDP. But now after we got through this consolidation period, which is this red area, this is when we lost airlines such as Northwest and AirTran, uh, US Airways, uh, just keep naming them. Uh, we lost about six carriers during that time frame as, as an industry. You can now start seeing they're paralleling each other at a very predictable rate. But our growth curve does not look like that. The local component of GDP is the gross regional product. So this is just a, a relationship between the gross regional product of the Manchester National MSA and our departing seats out of Manchester. And you can see right when we started going downhill was during the end that, that period of consolidation. So, the reason why that happened. Now you really need coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I don't expect you guys to look at this uh, uh, completely. Uh, just look at the spread between the red line and the blue line. It's the rise of what we call the oligopoly. We have four big carriers in the United States now. Delta, American, United and Southwest carry, and there's two ways of looking at this. Some people in my industry look at this number, 77% of all available seat miles. And the seat mile is your seat flying one mile. It's the standard unit of capacity used in, in aviation. But I looked at it a different way. Because when you go to Delta.com, you're purchasing a ticket on Delta. It's not looking at, you're not looking at the regional partner that's flying the aircraft. Delta tells you if it's going to be a mainline Delta or if it's going to be a regional uh, carrier. So from a consumer perspective, it's painted like Delta. It's got Delta napkins on it. It's got Delta flight attendants and Delta 
uh, uh, pilots in there in the Delta uniform, Air Force Delta Airlines, right? So I roll in the uh, regional jet component to this, and that number is really now 90%. Nine out of every 10 seat miles flown domestically are controlled by four carriers. We have undone, this is a bold statement, we have undone the benefits of deregulation in 1978 by allowing all these mergers to occur. Reason number two, airline departures remain below the pre-merger and acquisition period. So if we set merger and acquisition, beginning of the merger and acquisition, we just index that as F100. And we look at the different sizes of airports. And FAA classifies all airports into large hub, medium hub, or small hub. We're a small hub airport. A medium hub airport would be like Bradley. And a large hub airport would be Boston, New York, Atlanta, mm -hmm. Chicago. You can see, for, and we're the green line, we're still 31% below our total number of departures as a group than we were before mergers and acquisitions. The Hartfords of the world are 26%, and then even the large hubs, Boston, is down 6%. Okay, but look, the, the, the trend within the trend is we were the last group to really start seeing a, a, a growth rate, a positive growth rate, in terms of departures. Now, you might see the difference between seat or departures and seats. Look at the two lines. Okay? Seats have come back. That's because the airline aircraft have gotten bigger. That's that's a cost benefit to the airline because they could fly that fly the seats in, pick all of you up, and not have to fly a second flight to pick up the last table back down the corner. If they just fly a little bit bigger aircraft, they can pick everybody up. Reduce their cost because it's only one aircraft, only two pilots, three flight attendants, and one landing fee, one fuel bill versus six pilots and 12 flight crew and two landing fees and two fuel bills. So it's a benefit to the airline to fly a larger aircraft with more seats, but to you as a consumer, it shows the seats that it appears as if you don't have as much choice because you used to have the four o'clock flight, now you don't because it's, it's a large aircraft, so it's at two, and now it's at six. So the number of options that you are presented as a consumer have gone down. Reason number four is Southwest changed their business model during the merger and acquisition period. People don't realize what Southwest is now. This is the number of seats by the big four that are placed in small hub airports, okay? So just the Manchester's of the world. Delta has grown by two million seats, uh, American has grown by 10, that's mostly because they merged with U.S. Airways, and U.S. Airways had a significant presence in small hub airports. United has grown by three, but look at Southwest. They removed capacity from small hub airports. So the, the airline that would always come and serve secondary markets like Manchester or like Providence has changed their business model. And I don't think it's coming back. They are so focused right now on their Hawaii experiment between California and Hawaii. I will call it an experiment, that they are actually pivoting away from the entire New England region. We're down 8% on south, Southwest this year. Boston is down 10% in capacity. I think Providence is down 5 to 8%. I don't, I don't remember the, the, the true number. The only one that's treading water is, is Portland right now. They're, they're about even, and that's mostly because of a change in the gauge of aircraft. Reason number five is not all carriers are the same. Now, this is plotting the number of, of aircraft in service against the number of aircraft on board. Because I always hear people, oh, we're a Frontier. Well, people don't realize the size of Frontier Airlines. Okay, let me decode this for you. This is Delta, American United, and WN is the IATA code for Southwest. And then F9 is Frontier, B6 is JetBlue, AS is Alaska, MK is Spear. This one way down here, that's Allegiant. Okay. So you can see by the size of the dot, first of all, look at the big four, they're between 800 and 1,000 aircraft. They have 800, 800 to 1,000 airframes in their fleet. Your smaller air, air airlines have less than 300. But if you look at where the growth is, you got some big growth in these low cost and ultra low cost carriers. You do have some big growth in these main, mainline carriers, but the problem is a full 50% of their fleet is about to be 20 years or older. If you think about airlines and fixed costs, the only place that they really have to run to find efficiencies is taking the older aircraft out of service and putting in more fuel-efficient aircraft in. 
So we don't anticipate much growth from a capacity uh, perspective in those in those large carriers. Even JetBlue, we, I was just in talking to JetBlue just so you can have an understanding of what I'm, what I'm doing. I was down in Long Island City um, just last week, a week and a half, talking to JetBlue. They told us that the majority of their orders are going to replace a less efficient aircraft with a new, a new more uh, fuel efficient aircraft. So even JetBlue is not adding net new net capacity to their system. The only one that's really doing that are Frontier and Spirit. You can see the Legion really doesn't have an idea as to what it wants to be when it grows up. Um, and it's only got two air, aircraft on board right now. Yes, sir. So the Max 8 fiasco, that's all mostly just replacement stuff? It was well, no, the, the Max 8, um, that, that's a new aircraft. So that's going to stay in the fleet. Southwest is probably the whole, is the outlier when it comes to the big four. They have a very young fleet. So I think when they get the aircraft, they're going to add new capacity. So I think their, their thoughts are going to be that capacity is going to go to Hawaii and near Air National. It's not going to be domestic flying. Did Manchester have an impact? Because we did. Uh, we had less than 1% of our operations were on that, all on Southwest, because uh, we don't get American mainline here. And American was the only other uh, airline that had the Max 8. Um, in their fleet in the United States. So, uh, but less than 1% of our operations were on that stage. So, we, we've seen no negative impact due to that. And there's a slight pick up right at the time that they, they switched those out, but it had more to do with the fact that the uh, airline and the machinist union were under negotiations for a new collective bargaining agreement. And the airline was kind of stalling those negotiations. So, when the max aid issue came about, I think the unions found that they had some leverage over the airline and they quickly uh, came to terms, from what I understand, uh, to a new agreement. Because Southwest was starting to lose mainline aircraft to maintenance issues. And so they have like 10 to 12 percent of their fleet sitting on the ground, which is not good. All right, so the cost of the problem. As I said earlier, we'll get to we'll get to you know the economic numbers. But number one, the reduction in employment has resulted since 2009 at a conservative estimate has reduced our economic impact to the state by $400 million. Okay, in 2009, we were about, uh, excuse me, in uh, yeah, 2009, we were about $1.2 billion economic uh, engine to the state. In 2013, we were down to about $900 million. And since 2013, we've gone further down in terms of employment, so that number is probably more like $500 million at this point. So ask yourself, what would you do if you had another $4 billion or $5 billion in total economic impact over the last 10 years? Excuse me for the conflict region, region, but the entire region, um, that's 700,000 lost employments, resulted in about $1.8 million in lost revenue last year to the airport. And more importantly, about $7 million in lost grants and aid. So every time that airport, somebody gets in their car and they go to Massachusetts, you're sending federal AIP dollars, Airport Improvement Program, which is what pays for runways and taxiways, gives, allows me to get contracts to uh, engineering firms, whatever it may be, but then that dollar churns in the local economy at your local shopping center, at your local dry cleaner, whatever it may be, those $7 million, okay? That's one, one source of that is AIP. The other source of that is what we call the passenger facility charge. When you buy a ticket, you pay usually $4.50 um, on top of your ticket price. That $4.50 gets collected by the airlines. They take 12 cents and they remit to us $4.38. That money stays at the airport that, you, that uh, the ticket is purchased from. And it's to be used for airport development and uh, costs at that airport, okay? doesn't go into a trust fund, doesn't go into the general fund, doesn't go anywhere else. It stays at the airport. And that for us, what we use that for is to pay the debt down that we had, that we incurred for developing the, the parking deck, uh, the, the terminal building, extending our runways, all the stuff that we did 10 years ago, 15 years ago. We use those dollars to pay down that debt. So $7 million in direct loss, you can, uh, uh, great and aid, uh, type money. So if you, again, that's just the direct. So just multiply that eight and a half million, nine million dollars if you want to be really conservative, by three. And that's the total loss of economic impact of just uh, non-air nautical revenue, which is like parking 
and concessions, and then also the grants made. So we've seen this, this departing seats, but then this new line is what we call the cost per employment, which is the cost that we charge the air carriers to lease, the, lease terminal uh, space, to uh, have a landing fee, to lease the uh, terminal apron, the jet bridges. All that has gone up tremendously during this age of decline. Um, this is one area that I think is worth explanation a little bit. Here you see a tremendous spike in number of seats. This is when Southwest was really growing, doing really strong out of the market. This is before they pivoted their strategy and went into Boston. But you don't see a corresponding decrease. These should be almost mirrors of each other. Because again, this is a cost per employment, and this is charting against seats. Well, typically seats and people go together, right? In an airplane, um, I can't have an employment without a seat. Uh, so this should have been depressed much further down, but that's because at that time we were incurring a lot of debt. And that sowed the seed for this upward trajectory that we find ourselves on. This, my friends, is not competitive, $13.45. That's about the same as Boston. It's about the same as Providence. So if you're an airline net worth planner and you're making a $50 million decision, which it is a year you know, to, to serve an airport, are you gonna go where it costs the same, but you have a smaller catchment area population, or you want to go into Boston or Providence, and that's why we're losing out. So this result, or this results in us being the fifth most expensive airport for an airport of our size for an airline to operate out of. Uh, White Plains is above us, Huntsville, um, MDT is uh, Harrisburg, and then you got Guam, which uh, makes sense. Everything is more expensive out in the middle of the ocean. Uh, but these little black dot, uh, black arrows. Those are all of our competitors in the Northeast and New England region. And if you average out those, you get $10.05. So our, our, our target reduction is to get $3.15 per passenger off of our CPE. That's going to require $11 million in new revenue or cost avoidance at the airport in order to achieve that number. So what's the solution? Okay. Enough of the negativity. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay, but again, we have to be realistic. This is not meant to be a happy-go-lucky presentation. We have to be, we have to have an honest level setting of what is going on in the airport in order for us to move forward. So we have gotten smart about our region. Okay, uh, I came in and I started asking questions, basic questions of the staff: Where are we leaking? Who is leaking? How much are we leaking? And I got a bunch of stares back at me. Okay, so now we know what zip codes. It was pretty easy. Just have to spend a, just a few thousand dollars to get access to some databases, and we were able to start identifying um, uh, the, the answers to these questions. Where are they flying? What are the consumer profiles? Okay. So now we're overlaying customer segmentation data, Prism data, Claritas. Anybody uses that in marketing? Anybody? Anybody familiar with that? Okay. So whenever you are swiping your credit card everywhere. Of course, people are tracking what you're buying. They know your zip code because you give it to them. They know your income because you give it to them. They know a lot about you. What we're doing is getting on the on the zip code level what those consumer preferences are. Not, not individually, but on the zip code level. Okay, so if we overlay the consumer preferences against the zip codes that we're leaking on, now we can start identifying ways to market to the consumer that makes sense to them because it's based on information that we're getting about their consumer preferences. So this will enhance our digital marketing. We actually increased our marketing budget for the first time in 10 years, uh, but now we're going to also be a lot more precise about how we're spending that money, and then our barometer is going to be that leakage rate in each of those zip codes. Hopefully it goes down. If, uh, if that leakage rate stays the same, plus minus one or two percent, then we know we're not doing a good job of reaching the consumer. But we hope this will uh, actually start influencing. So I'll show you a map here of our targeted zip codes. It doesn't, should not come as a surprise that it's in the southern tier of the state. Now we are going to add in zip codes that are in Concord, in Manchester, in downtown Nashville, up in the Upper Valley, but primarily south and east of the airport is where we are going to focus our, um, our uh, digital marketing efforts going forward. So again, right along, the, right along the border, we're seeing a lot of leakage down in Boston. We think that's a little bit of a demographic change as well, because a lot of people are moving in from Massachusetts, and they may not know that we even exist. If 
we're not marketing ourselves correctly. They may just default to the airport they've always chosen, which is Logan, because they moved from Chelmsford. So uh, other ways that we're looking at uh, uh, driving customer engagement is uh, looking to enhance our FastPass parking program. How many of you are familiar with FastPass? How many are FastPass holders? Okay. All right, so FastPass, for those of you, uh, of you who are not familiar, is a frequent parker program. So for every dollar of parking, uh, you get a point, and then you can redeem those points for free parking. Um, right now, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a good program, uh, but we think it could be a little bit better. Because you may not want to redeem it for parking. You may want to redeem it for you know, a free sandwich at you know, the, the Sam Adams. Or you may want to use it like an airline mile and buy a golf club you know, for, for, for your golf season coming up. Uh, but we're also looking at uh, maybe tweaking the way that you your earn points. So if you park on a parking deck, maybe it's a point and a half for every dollar. If you park in the surface lot, maybe it's you know, three quarters of a point, or maybe we keep it at one point per dollar. So we're looking at enhancing the, the, uh, the number of points you can get, but also the ways that you can uh, redeem those points. So it's a credit card, credit, uh, credit card in, credit card out for you at the, at the parking booth as well. So if you uh, sign up, you link your credit card to your profile, you get a proximity card. If you, next time you go through the, the entry, the ticket spitters, or also through the, the exit, you'll see a little fast pass uh, reader. You just tap your card, the gate opens. And then when you leave, you check your card, the gate opens, and out you go. Uh, you don't have to see the cashier. You don't have to have you know, any of that information. So it's a much easier in and out process for the passenger as well. And then, of course, we're working hard to find a new carrier. Um, we have just this first part of the year, I've, I've met with seven different airlines. Uh, I've met with all of our incumbent carriers. I, I owed them the opportunity first to uh, respond to uh, the new information that we're bringing to them and also to the new management. Um, we received some good wins, uh, but now I'm going to the carriers that we don't have on the airfield. So we can get you there, okay? That's, I think it's an awareness issue that we can't get you to where you wanna go. We serve 12 hubs. Colorado Springs serves five hubs. Eugene connects you to six hubs. We have 34 daily flights. They have about in the mid 20s. We have 3,400 seats. They have about 2,000 daily seats. We can get you to 184 non-stop but one-stop destinations. Our average fare is $410. That's very competitive against Boston. And we can get you to 54% of those 184 destinations with connection time less than 90 minutes, which is the same 90 minutes, if you're lucky, that you'll be spending on 93. <laughs> so it's about a choice of how you want to fly. So we're moving forward. Uh, this has already started. Uh, United Washington Dulles uh, announcement that it's now uh, uh, they moved away from Newark. I did not cry a tear when they said they were going to move from to Dulles. I said, fantastic, thank you. Uh, it's a much better performing hub than Newark. How many of you got canceled or delayed in the Newark flight? A lot of you. Um, and they've also increased the aircraft type. So you have a, a first class cabin if you're a premium passenger or you're a million miler or whatever it may be on United, you can actually get into that cabin. Whereas uh, on the Newark service, you, you couldn't. Uh, American to Chicago here, two times daily service on CRJ 700 aircraft. Again, that's a much better aircraft than when United was flying to Chicago here. So we think that perhaps can perform a lot better than, than United. And that starts on June 6th. Uh, bookings look pretty good right now. So the market is, is responding to it favorably. We need to pull it up a little bit more here in the next month um, in order for it to be good. And when we talk to American, and the bottom line air service is this, folks, you get and you keep the service you support. That's it, okay? When we talk to American, they said, we'll start you off at two. If you do well, we'll add a third. And if you do well, we may go mainline. And then we'll look at Dallas, and then we'll look at Miami, and all the other locations that we all want to get to. But that's straight from the network planner's mouths. They said, first you got to prove it to me on this. And if the community doesn't support that, then guess what? O'Hare's gonna leave again, okay? So we have to do a good job as a community of supporting that service. So if you're heading west, if you're trying to get to Seattle or San Francisco or LA or San Diego, you got another good option to get you there, okay? So this is gonna add about 80,000 parking seats a year to the airport, which is a good thing. Uh, but I, I, I'm debated even having this in the presentation because we're one 
frequency removed by a soft blast from seeing that number go to a red number instead of a black number. So this is what gives me hope, okay? Now, bear with me on this one. It's my last rat, um, I think. Uh, so this is American Airlines share of regional demand. So if you just go back to that, that first graph that showed the leakage down to 85% now, and you just control for American Airlines or US Airways pre-2016, and you just say, okay, how many tickets within 25 miles flew on American or US Airways out of Manchester or out of Boston? In 2013, you had about a 50-50 split. That eroded pretty significantly to 2016 to about a 70-30 split. But then American started doing something. They're the only carrier that is adding capacity to this market. They're the only carrier that is growing their market share in the market. This is something that we're throwing in front of all the airlines, which is kind of taboo. You don't go to JetBlue and talk about American Airlines. But I'm like, hey guys, look at this, okay? Then you look at this red, this candy striped area. That is increased market share, because look what's happening. The, the, the leakage is going backwards. People are now flowing to the airport. They're doing a better job of capturing that demand within 25 miles because you have the ability to fly the airport. We know our net promoter score. Anybody familiar with the net promoter score? Okay. For those of you who don't know, a net promoter, as I say, I took a, took a survey of all of you. And the, the, the question that you hear, and you probably participated in these surveys, how likely are you to um, recommend product X to your family or friends? Have you been asked that survey question at the end of a, uh, at the end of a purchase? That's a net promoter score question. So if we, did, if we asked everybody in this room that question, you take everybody who scores a nine or a ten as, yeah, I will respond. I will recommend that to a friend or family member. Those are your promoters. Everybody who says uh, seven or eight, that's kind of in the middle. They're they're near a promoter or a detractor. And everybody who scores zero to six is a detractor. So net promoter score can go from negative one hundred up to positive one hundred. Anything over a positive thirty is considered a, a good score. At least that's the last time I read my Harvard Business Review. Is that a true statement? <laughs> okay. So we have a net promoter score of 37, which makes sense. People love flying the airport. We hear that all the time. It's just that you can't fly the airport. So part of our discussion with the airlines is that it's not a demand issue. It is a capacity issue. We have been overly restricted in terms of capacity being placed by the carriers. So I'm very positive about this This. this uh, this market. I would not have picked up my family and moved halfway across the country if I did not believe in this market. We have a very high growth rate in personal income. Our per capita income is about $7,500 higher than the national average. We have the sixth highest per capita disposable income, and that's the, that, those are the dollars that like to travel. They like to, they like to see the world. All that wealth is pretty much in this tri-county area. Um, this, this blows people away that Rockingham County is in the 97th percentile in terms of per capita income. That's equal to Orange County, California, Lake County, Illinois, uh, uh, Bucks County, Pennsylvania, okay, uh, where Taylor Swift lives. Okay? That is a very, very high number. That's the top 100 counties out of 3,000 counties in the United States. Okay? Hillsborough County is in the 94th percentile. That puts us up there against. Um, um, Cuyahoga County, or not, not Cuyahoga, Africa, Guyaga County, which is just a, a, up on the hills overlooking Cleveland. Um, and then Marymount County is in the 92nd percentile. So we're, we're, we have unbelievable wealth in here. What you don't see is what you see in Orange County, California, which are the Bentleys and the Rolls and everything else. And I, I tell everybody, if you come here, you would never know that we're at that level of income because everybody would rather have a second home on Lake Winnie or down in down in South Florida. Well, Bentley suck in the snow too. <laughs> yes, they do. That's a good point. <laughs> so, and this this is just some of the information that we're sharing with carriers to change their perception because when they when they hear New Hampshire, they think of maple syrup and leaves. That's it. They don't think of the business. Was that in every four, in every four years? years. Exactly. Um, but you'd be surprised how many of the network planners, which are all about 21, 22 years old, don't know that. Okay. Um, we've asked them to point to New Hampshire on a map, and they're like, okay, well, that. Um, if we're lucky. 
Um, so four out of every 10 new households in the American Community Survey had household incomes over 100,000. And two out of those four homes, or 50% or 20% of the total, had incomes over 150,000. So we're seeing a tremendous growth in social economics. So how can you help make this together? Get it, MHT? Let's make this together. Uh, vote with your keyboard, okay? Fly Manchester first. Um, just think of Manchester, but you gotta flip the script, as we call it. So if you're on a business trip or you have loved ones that are coming in, work with them, be flexible in your schedule, but if you are if you have a business trip, say, hey, Kevin, I can't be there next Tuesday, but can I be there next Thursday? Will that work? I understand there's some business trips that you just can't do that on, and I get that. I don't for a second think that we can get that 85% down to zero, okay? If I can get it from 85 to 50 or 85 to 60, if we can just be like Providence, then that will change the trajectory of this airport and make my job in selling the airport a lot easier. But early and often, ask yourself, do you want to see taillights on 93 or one-way lights out your window? Mm -hmm. um, but you got to book early, you've got to book often. And if you're if you're last weekend jock and you're just wanting to go down to Orlando, I, I can't help you. Uh, because that capacity is so constrained, as we saw in those numbers, you've got to get in early if you want to have the fare. Our average fare, out of, between us and Boston, like the average fare between here and Orlando versus Jet Blue from Boston, Orlando, we're actually cheaper. Okay? So about twenty dollars. I understand it's an average, and I had a statistic professor that said, Ted, be careful with averages, because if you shoot at a duck and miss to the left and you re aim and shoot the same duck and miss to the right, on average you're having duck. <laughs> <laughs> so averages can be misleading. <laughs> Examine your travel habits, those of your businesses and those of your clients. And ask yourself, are we doing all that you can? If they're coming to see you, and they're flying into Boston, you need to you need to challenge them, okay? And, and even if they have businesses in Boston, a lot of people think they have to fly in and fly out of the same airport. Have them fly into Logan, do their business in Cambridge or Long 495, drive up, come and see you, and then get on an airplane out of Manchester and fly back home, okay? I mean, it's just split the trip. It's called a multi-city ticket. You can do it, in fact, sometimes those are cheaper than if you just go in and out of the same, same airport. Um, I had a consultant that came to me, I flew in from San Francisco to Boston, and I almost redlined his, 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 his invoice. I said, you do that again, I'm not paying you. Okay, so you're going to work for the airport. You better be coming into the airport. Uh, and I know uh, this extends to the government. I mean, one of the things that the city of Manchester we have on the uh, automatic committee is changing our travel policy. You know, so that anybody who's flying on the city of Manchester dollars, Better be flying out of Manchester Airport, and I would ask our state representatives to do the same thing with state businesses. If you're flying out of the airport, you need to be keeping those dollars coming back into the state and not giving it to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And then be an advocate. Uh, I always like to say this we're the Main Street shop, we're the small guy. Logan is the big box. So you know, shop local, fly local. Uh, this, is, this is something that we all have to be an advocate for. Go out and carry forth whatever nugget of information you can recall from this presentation. And talk to your friends, talk to your families. There's only one Ted, thank God. Um, you know, I can't be doing this you know, forever. I'll do it as much as I can. But I can only have a certain bandwidth that I can get to in terms of talking to, to groups and communities. So with that, thank you very much. Uh, you can find me on all these platforms.